Welcome to the topic of endocrinology. Today, I'm going to be spending some good amount of time on endocrine pathologists in regards to the adrenal gland. Now, this chapter is actually designed for Cushing's disease and Cushing's syndrome, but there's no way I can actually start that without talking about the adrenal gland. And talking about it's a whole physiological property so that we can all be on the same boat when we get to Cushing syndrome. So let's get the bandwagon started. Now I don't want you to get intimidated by the pathway on the right hand side of this board, uh, but because we're going to go over it step by step. And I'm going to tell you what's really important and what's not important. On the right side, I've drew, I draw out the uh, adrenal gland. Now, one of the things you have to know about the adrenal gland is that it's made out of the cortex. The cortex in medicine always means the outside of something. The inside, which is called the medulla, which would be the core of every organ. Now, the cortex is broken down into three major layers. The first layer is called the, and the three zones. Zona glomerulosa, from the word glomerulus, because there's probably a lot of glomerulus in that side of the uh, of the cortex. The fasciculata, I kind of like that, sounds sexy. Fasciculata, to fasciculate. And the reticularis. Those are the three things, main zones, you need to know. Now, let's take a pause. Why do we need to know them? because they produce hormones and we need to know about the steroid hormones because that's the key to this lecture. Now, the mnemonic is GFR, not glomerular filtration rate, which is perfect, right? Glomerular filtration rate, which is what we use to measure how much your kidney is filtering ultrafiltration during the kidney's function. Now, how do we actually remember it? GFR, GFR, right? Glomerulosa, reticul fasciculata, and reticularis. The way I remember it is it's salt, sugar, and sex. Because the deeper it goes, the sweeter it is, guys. Ooh, that's nasty. Yeah, that's how we do it in medicine. The, the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. So it's salty on the outside initially, I know. But it starts to taste good because you make some sugar. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And you start to get sexy, guys. So what are we talking about? The zona glomerulosa. Glomerulosa. Actually, I don't have to write it anymore because that's what's going to bring it to the side of the board. The zona glomerulosa is going to make aldosterone, which is responding for... Sodium reabsorption, that's the salt, guys. Keep up your blood pressure. The fasciculata is going to make the glucocorticoids. Gluco, glucose, corticoids. Cortisol is the major hormone we need to know. That's the fasciculata. And the reticularis is testosterone. Those are the androgens. That's sex, guys. So it makes them sexy because you can see testosterone. Estradiol, dihydrotestosterone, androstenedione, estrone, they all sound sterile like sex, right? You need those for sex. That's what determines for male or female, right? So, although this pathway might seem sickening, which we're gonna still go over, I want you to realize it's all built in this beautiful organ called the adrenal, the adrenal gland. Now, before we go to the medulla, which has chromaffin cells, and we're going to talk about their function, let's focus on this right side of the image. Now, we're going to go very slowly because it's very important that, especially if you're taking the United States Medical Licensing Exam, which is the USMLE, or you're taking the COMLEX, which is the Comprehensive Osteopathic Licensing Examination. They will, you will get tested because they love to peek on this pathway. It's called the steroid pathway. Hmm, what do steroids look like? Well, because I love organic chemistry, okay? And do not mind my drawings because you do not, by any means, need to memorize this. But like, I always try to be complete. 
with my lectures, as you can see, steroids is full of all these hydrocarbons. So they are lipid soluble. And we're gonna talk about why that's key on how steroids work. So we can understand how cortisol work. So when we talk about Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome, you're like, oh, I, can, I know, I get it. That's why I'm here, guys. Cholesterol. Cholesterol is a steroid, right? It's a steroid. What the cholesterol is gonna do, it's gonna be converted by the enzyme called desmolase. It's kind of destroying it. But it makes pregnenolone. Do I need to remember this? No, that is not important. But the key important thing I want you to know is this hormone, ACTH. What is that? What is ACTH stands for? And where does it come from? Uh, it's called adrenal corticotropic hormone. Now let's break those words. It's the big fancy words, four letter words, right? One, two, three, four, right? Adrenal, that means the hormone is gonna act on the adrenal gland. Cortico, cortico right? It's gonna act on the adrenal cortex, right? Especially the sugar part of it. Tropic means attract, attraction. So it's a hormone that's attracted to the adrenal cortex. Beautiful. How do you like that? I just broke that stupid, silly, long word into pieces. ACTH. It's gonna activate the enzyme called desmolase. Now desmolase is not gonna activate this pathway. And now I want you to just follow closely. Pregnenolone is gonna drop all the way down. And this is all happening in the zona glomerulosa to from progesterone. I think we've heard about progesterone. Who has progesterone? Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. Women do have progesterone. Look at that. They do have progesterone. I'm pretty sure we do have them too. That male has to have progesterone because we have to we need a what? I think we need an adrenal gland too. So if we have an adrenal gland, I must make it progesterone, but we never what manifest it. Progesterone is not converted by 21-alpha-hydroxylase, which is an enzyme that we can actually get a deficiency in, but we're not going to go into in this lecture. 21-alpha-hydroxylase is going to convert progesterone into 11 deoxy corticosterone. Now, this enzyme is not going to be converted by 11-beta-hydroxylase into corticosterone, which by aldosterone synthase, converts to aldosterone. That is a crazy pathway, don't you think? Oh, it gets worse. This same pregnenolone, sounds like pregnant, right? Pregnant hormone. Pregnenolone is converted by 17 hydroxylase into 17 hydropregnenolone. Basically, it puts an hydroxyl group on the pregnenolone, and you can see it's hydro, and it's on the 17 carbon. And this is eventually converted to DHEA. What is DHEA, guys? It's dehydroepiandrosterone. That's a big mouthful. It's basically like an analog of testosterone, basically. That's the bottom one. By another hormone, which I don't care about. This hormone here is gonna drop down in the fascicle ladder. So now we're in this fascicular, we're done in the glomerulosa, the G part, we just made it what? A mineral low corticoid, which is aldosterone. That's where the salt is. Let's make some sugar. 17 hydropregnenolone is gonna drop down and be converted into 17 alpha hydroprogesterone. Basically, progesterone is the same thing progesterone here, but as you can see, 17 alpha is just because the alpha carbon is gonna carry an hydroxyl because 17 hydroxylase is an hydroxylase is an enzyme that puts a, a, a hydroxyl group on the 17th carbon of this steroid to make 17 alpha hydros progesterone. Now 21 alpha hydroxyl, which is the same enzyme here. Literally, we could just say this enzyme is basically acting on the same levels, right? Convert 
17 hydroprogesterone to 11 deoxycortisol, which eventually is going to be converted by 11 beta hydroxylase into cortisol. <sighs> Why did I do that? <laughs> it's because trying to memorize all the enzymes in this pathway will be crazy, and we're going to figure out a shortcut to remember them. Eventually, 17 hydroprogesterone will be converted to androstenedione, which will be what? Aromatized. Aroma. You can smell the aroma. The aromatizes into estrone, and it, this drops down to form testosterone. This is how testosterone is made in our body, which also can be aromatized. It's like God made man, and he made a woman out of man. Sounds like the same story here. Testosterone is going to be aromatized with a little, little bit of aroma, a little bit of extra assets on the man to make a woman. And you make estradiol. 5 alpha reductase is now going to make dihydrotestosterone. And this is all happening in the reticularis. Now, these little hormones that you see here are going to be acting peripherally. That's why estrogen causes women to have what? Breasts. Right? They get proliferation inside the uterus. They have a menstrual cycle. As they, they've got their progesterone also coming from the ovaries. So not just from the adrenal gland. Now, this is crazy pathway. Now, so how do we memorize it? Hmm. That's going to be interesting. This is how I memorized it. I made it shorten. And what I did is, I would just write on the inside a sheet of paper and it says, cholesterol, which is CHL. It's going to be broken down to something with an X. If you want to remember pregnant woman, I don't care because it's not important. But what's important is I know that ACTH has to activate an enzyme called decimalase. It's not a high yield enzyme. Nobody cares. But X is going to go to another X, like Y, right? And Y is going to form eventually, we're going to form DHEA. X. Is going to go to Z okay you know what let's just a, use a B C so that actually makes it easier cholesterol is going to do something with an A which is going to turn to a B right now I'm here right a B now it's very important that I remember this enzyme for my board exam because again I'm gonna get pimped on it so I have to put a 21 when B is going to C which is what corticosteroid I will need a 21 alpha hydroxylate. That's a very important enzyme I need to know for my boards because there are clinical symptoms patients do present with when they come in with this kind of deficiency. So I have to know that. So A, C is now eventually going to go to what? D, which is aldosterone, right? Eventually, this is C and C, C goes to like DC, right? C goes to like to call it C1, C2, whatever it is, but there's an 11 alpha hydroxylase here which is eventually going to form what? Aldosterone. Now, that's all I care about because I don't need to know all this junk. I don't care. I need to know 21 alpha hydroxylase, 17 alpha hydroxylase, and 11. Those are the three enzymes I really need to care about. So when I do this, this is A, B, C, D, right? So we're going to go to E. A goes to E now. He's going to go to F, right? And F is going to go to cortisol. Okay? One, actually, yeah, EFG, actually. Let's see, G right here, and eventually I'm going to form cortisol. Now, I'm going to need these two enzymes. As you can see, it's very easy. They're working on the same levels, so I really don't need to worry myself. See how they're working on the same levels? But I don't need to memorize these enzymes because they're not important. The important thing to know is that when I have 11 beta hydroxylase, what enzymes am I not going to be able to make, right? Because if I don't have 21, look, if I cut off 21 here, I'm not going to be able to go down this pathway to make aldosterone. That sucks, right? If I cut off this pathway, I'm not going to be able to make cortisol, and that's all I do, see? If I cut off this pathway, I can't make aldosterone, and I can't make cortisol. That's all that's important. That's all you need to know. If I cut off 11, I'm not going to be able to make what? Aldosterone, and I'm not going to be able to make cortisol either. See that? It's very interesting. Here, I know F is going to form, now I need to know this, androstenedione, androstenedione, right? 
because that's gonna form an estrone. That is very important because aromatase is gonna aromatize that. Can you see that? This enzyme is gonna come down to form testosterone, which I need to remember that is gonna form estradiol because those are key important enzymes. And this is gonna form DHT by 5 alpha reductase because we have actually drugs that inhibit 5 alpha reductase inhibitors that we use for patients with prostate cancer, I mean, pro BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Now, the reason why I'm telling you to just do it in a simple format, right, to try to do this, is because this is cuts down the craziness in the physiology of the adrenal gland, right? If you're gonna be a biochemist, hey, welcome on board. So, what is the method to my madness? I put everything that's important in red. That's why they're in red, so that you can see all of them right here. Cholesterol, right? Aldosterone, cortisol, DHT, testosterone, estradiol, estrone, dihydroestradiol, DHEA, ACTH. Are you with me? This makes your life easy. If you try to go this route, you must be a super genius. I'm not. So I try to make this very easy for myself. I just put a bunch of arrows in there and make sure I know what's missing. I could care less about what's in the middle. Are we good? If this works for you, do it. If that works for you, great. Now let's focus back on our topic. Now that we got all the craziness out of the way. We said salt, sugar, sex. The deeper you go, the sexy it becomes, no, the sweeter it is. Now, I want you to realize that ACTH goes through this pathway to eventually make cortisol. Because when we have hypercortisolism in Cushing's syndrome, that's where we're gonna be focusing on. So that would be part two of our lecture, but before we end part one, let's take a look at the adrenal medulla. The medulla is inside and has chromaffin cells. These chromaffin cells are actually under the activation of sympathetic nerve fibers. These pre-sympathetic nerve fibers actually carry acetylcholine, which is actually gonna activate the chromaffin cells to contract and secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine. Hmm, what are those called? Catecholamines. These catecholamines are made up of what? Norepinephrine and epinephrine. I'm gonna make you one of the smartest people I like today because which of these hormones is mostly made, has the, you have you, the, the adrenal cortex, the medulla makes about 80% epinephrine and about 20% norepinephrine. Do you know why that happens? I figured it out. It's because the venous drainage of the adrenal cortex. So the venous drainage coming from the adrenal cortex is very high in cortisol. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does make any sense because that's where cortisol is coming from, right? The uh, zone, zona fasciculata makes a lot of cortisol, right? And increases the transcription of the PM, PNMT uh, enzyme which makes epinephrine into norepinephrine. So let's draw the pathway. This is where cortisol actually acts. Epinephrine is actually converted into norepinephrine by the action of cortisol on this enzyme, which I don't really know what it, it's, it's a really long name, and when things are really unnecessary, 
the key point for you to know is that 80% of epinephrine is made in the adrenal medulla and about 20% is only made in the adrenal cord uh, uh, it's made because the venous drainage kind of coming down into the adrenal medulla has a lot of cortisol can you believe cortisol actually converts epinephrine into norepinephrine if cortisol does that I want you to remember this pathway because when we get to part two and I tell you when you have high cortisol you're gonna have high blood pressure well I don't want you to be surprised because what do you think norepinephrine is gonna do to your blood vessels it's gonna vasoconstrict them keep that at the back of your mind that's extremely important because that's the mechanism and by how when you're stressed out how cortisol maintains your blood pressure because we're going to talk about the steroid hormones in a minute now we're not done yet because we still need to talk about how steroid hormones act we said they're steroids so steroids are lipid soluble they go through that bilayer right the phospholipid bilayer right and diffuse through it when they go inside a cell a steroid I'm gonna just use it like a little box like a benzene ring when it goes inside a cell it goes into the cytoplasm and here is the nucleus taking you back to genetics that's the DNA right it's gonna go to the nucleus and bind to a protein and that protein is now gonna go into the nucleus to bind to the DNA and DNA is gonna be transcribed into messenger RNA right and that messenger RNA is gonna eventually make a protein which is an enzyme you need to know this. You know why? Because this is how all steroids are going to work. The diffusion to the cell goes to the cytoplasm, bind to a steroid binding hormone, a globulin, right? The hormone binds to the globulin. It gets carried into the nucleus. It binds to the DNA, opens it up. We transcribe the message. We make a protein because it's extremely important to know that this is how it works. Because when I talk about how cortisol because that's going to be the key hormone we're going to be talking about right now actually acts to cause impaired glucose tolerance by increasing your blood sugar because we're going to go back to the pathway of gluconeogenesis and that's how we're going to know wow cortisol ca does cause elevated amount of blood sugar now we've talked about the basics of adrenal physiology In summary, before we move on to the next part of this lecture, which is actually talking about the Cushing's syndrome and disease, we need to wrap this up by talking about the function of cortisol. Now we can erase this. Right? Let's erase that. What are the functions of cortisol? Number one, it's an anti-inflammatory agent. Huh, look at that. Anti-inflammation. So how does it call anti-inflammation? Anti-inflammation Miss prevents inflammation. <sighs> Let's see. Let's go back to arachidonic acid pathway, right? Where you have arachidonic acid, arachidonic acid eventually is broken down into, I believe, HPT. Um, actually. When you go into the cyclooxygenase pathway and the lipoxygenase pathway, right there, the phospholipase A2 enzyme is inhibited by cortisol because it's a steroid. So when you cut off this pathway, you can make prostaglandin E, E2, D, 
I2 from books in A2 process IT F2 alpha you can make the lipo oxy like trines A B C D see that's how I memorize things I don't go through all the whole thing because I know I like Cox 1 Cox 2 but once we cut it off from the phospholipase A2 which is the enzyme that kills our carcinogenic acid cortisol is going to inhibit that from happening and we can't cause inflammation because these are all the things that cause inflammation right there so it causes anti-inflammatory effect that's why we put people on steroids every time you get inflammation because you prevent this pathway from being activated are you with me please hang in there you're doing great it also causes gluconeogenesis Glucon neogenesis what is gluconeogenesis gluco means glucose neo means new genesis means generation of new glucose now let's go back to biochemistry <gasps> oh god yeah i know we need to do it we need to go back to back biochemistry and it's going to be very simple because i'm not going to drive you nuts we know glucose eventually is converted to pyruvate right Pyruvate. And pyruvate eventually is called acetyl coenzyme A, which goes to the TCA cycle, blah, blah, blah. And inside the TCA cycle is oxaloacetate, oxaloacetate. Now, oxaloacetate actually has to come back into the cytoplasm. This is the cytoplasm and be converted by this enzyme called PEP carboxy carboxylase, which is phosphoenopyruvate. Actually, it will be right here. Phosphoenopyruvate is right there so that we can bypass this pathway and guess who is gonna activate and make this hands on oh god it's cortisol folks so cortisol like i drew initially is gonna go into the cytoplasm right bind to your steroid hormone go into the nucleus and activate the dna to be able to make pep carboxylase and pep carboxylase under the influence of cortisol will now make Phosphoenopyruvate. Phosphoenopyruvate can now reverse the glycolysis pathway to form more glucose. I bet you're loving this, right? Because once you understand the biochemical origin of all of these enzymes, you get it. You have to listen to this lecture at least twice so you understand it completely. So we just explained why cortisol causes gluconeogenesis. The second function is also it causes lipolysis and proteolysis. And this is going to be key when we talk about cushions because we're going to talk about the clinical symptoms that they look like and you're going to be like, oh, yeah, we did talk about it. We did talk about it. It breaks down your fat and it breaks down your protein, increases the amount of glucose. Now, why do we need that? Why does cortisol need to do all this? We will talk about that when we talk about the stress response the body needs. When you're stressed out. It decreases your immunity. What cortisol does is decreases neutrophilic function. In basic pathology, when you look inside your bloodstream, right? Neutrophils need to migrate. Right? They migrate, they attach, adhere, and go to wherever the bacteria is infiltrating to cause the damage. The only problem is when you have steroids, it prevents the neutrophils from adhesing. So it causes it prevents from you know, adhering to the wall of the endothelial cells. So they kept, just keep floating around, it's like it's coating them. 
That's what happened when people are on steroids. That's why always they immunosuppressed because they're on steroids. And the reason is because neutrophils is going to cause inflammation. We don't want them to cause inflammation when it causes damages. It surrounds them around and prevents them. That's what call it. it causes leukocytosis because all basically it's peeling them off from the wall of the endothelial cells and now they're just floating around. Now, the fourth function of cortisol is to maintain your blood pressure. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How does he do that? I just told you. Epinephrine is always converting to what? Norepinephrine under the influence of what? Cortisol. PNMT, which you don't need to know that. But the bottom line is, what does norepinephrine do when your blood pressure drops? It vasoconstricts your blood vessels, increases your afterload, increases your preload, increases cardiac output, increases your blood pressure, right? It's going to increase your heart rate. So there you go. You can maintain your blood pressure, right? This is how everything is connected, guys. Cortisol does that. That's how it maintains your blood pressure. The next function is it also decreases bone formation. That's why these patients are predisposed to osteoporosis. I'm not really teaching you about Cushing syndrome indirectly, but we're still going to get to it. And those are the key functions of cortisol. So now that we've understood what cortisol normally do, let's find out in part two of this lecture exactly how patients are going to present with and what is actually causing too much cortisol to be produced in the body and how do we figure this out. Watch this coming up in the next lecture, part two, Cushing's syndrome.